Okay, yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, looks like we've got a full house tonight, so thank you for joining me, and uh, thank you to the British Tobacco Club for, for hosting this event. Uh, if you have any questions, if you could leave them till the end, as was just explained. The main facilitator for this evening, unfortunately, has gone off sick, so um, if we have any IT issues, please bear with us while we sort of sort those out. So before I kick off, um, I'll, I'll confess that I have an agenda, and it's an agenda, no doubt, shared by many of you listening. And that agenda is to improve repeater uh, diving safety. So as such, uh, the main topic of discussion this evening is a subject I've been trying to raise awareness of for ugh, well over a decade, because it's a subject I know from first-hand experience that uh, saves lives. So I'm therefore hoping that the, the strength of the argument and the body of support and evidence that I present this evening uh, will make you reconsider your approach to would be the diving, uh, particularly if you hold a position of leadership in the diving community, uh, not just for your own personal safety, of course, but also for those who look up to you for guidance and example. So the optics through which I do this subject are, are varied. So I'll briefly explain my background and experience that has shaped my perspective on tonight's subject, because through these optics, we will all be viewing the subject this evening. So I've been diving with breathers for uh, some 30 years. So along the way, I picked up a, a few Oscar badges. He's a first class diver, uh, um, advanced mixed gas instructor trainer with a number of agencies. Um, I've been a member of a non profit organization in the US that supplies um, sort of subject matter expertise to law enforcement for rebreather investigations. Uh, invited keynote speaker at various diving conferences and events with a particular focus on rebreather safety. And for the last 15 years, um, I've been up here in the northeast of Scotland, um, diving, finding new shipwrecks in you know, the 60 to 100 meter range and have organized various uh, sort of expeditions around the world. But where did this all start? Well, an embarrassing long time ago, I joined the Royal Marines. And after some five years of that, I volunteered to run around the hills of Wales and the, the Brunei jungle. So after six months of that fun and games, I picked up a few more Boy Scout badges and then got trained as a combat diver. Um, and this is where my rebreather diving started in earnest. So eventually qualified as a UK Special Forces Diving Instructor and Diving Supervisor. And this, of course, is where I began to fully appreciate the hazards associated with rebreather diving. I have personally witnessed uh, numerous incidents and accidents during that time. So because by then I was a very keen sport diver, it was so inevitable I would focus on the sort of underwater maneuver side of the side of the business. So I qualified as swimming delivery pilot navigator. And these are free flood mini submarines that they launched from the back of a larger submarine. And uh, STV operations, you know, they represent the most complex form of military diving with multiple gases, multiple personnel, multiple depths, um, multiple decompression obligations, uh, with dives lasting out to eight to ten hours. And during this period, I also took part in various rebreather trials for new equipments and also physiolog physiological trials in extreme environments like extreme cold, extreme warm water. And then I retired early from the military and I went, went to work for a company called Divex, um, now JFD, um, the world's largest manufacturer of professional diving equipment. And my focus, no surprise, was on military diving, in particular with breeders. Um, so I've had 20 years now in the development, design, test and training of, of military rebreathers. And this activity is including laboratory and man testing, manned testing, um, I'm still very active test diving, rebreathers. I come off uh, out of R&D, where I, where I principally work at the moment, and testing new generations of uh, submersible vehicles. Also, for the last 20 years, I've been running around the world, training various military teams on the whole suite of uh, underwater life support systems, from basic oxygen rebreathers to fully closed circuit electronically controlled uh, mixed gas rebreathers for use down to 80, 90 meters in 
MCM, mine clearing styling sort of uh, environments. So it's an eclectic background, as you can see, it encompasses, um, you know, sport, technical diving, professional, diving risk management and mitigation, review the design and test, accident investigation. So through these optics, all of us will be viewing the right subject. So I'll kick off um, properly then with uh, a case study. So we breathe the dive which is following the 30 meter wreck dive. It's an uneventful dive. He's observed by the safety boat acting unresponsibly. He then submerges beyond the help of those around him. Confused and bewildered, the diver becomes aware that he's back in the water alone and rapidly sinking. There's a strong tide sweeping him off sight, so he realized he was in more of danger. He instinctively inflates his BC, which begins to slow his uncontrolled descent. He switches his bailout valve to open circuit, and he eventually arrives back at the surface and was recovered by the safety boat. Once back on board, the magnitude of what has happened began to dawn on this diver. He had just survived a chain of events that in every, epi any, every event you've ever read or heard about, consequence was drowning. But against the odds, here he was, safely back on board. And that evening, he would, he would be returning home to his wife and two young children. So this story is not fiction. It's uh, a former trainee of mine who's happy to share his story so we can all learn from it. Um, the diver in question, soon after this, went on to achieve a lifetime ambition and died with the HMS uh, Titanic in 120 meters. So the critical reason for his unlikely survival I'll come back to at the end of this presentation. But in contrast, in the same year following a wreck dive, after 10 minutes at the six meter decompression stop, I would breathe a lost consciousness, sank, and was lost. Friends later recovered his body from the seabed a few days later. Now, the disabling injury in both these cases is identical, hypoxia. However, the outcomes could not be more different. So the presentation this evening is aimed at all levels of, uh, of diver, from someone considered to be the diving to the highly experienced. So in part one, I'm just going to lay a foundation, which for the experienced diver, a lot of this you will be very familiar with. So we're going to look at the complexity of life support systems that we use, hazard and risk associated with rebreathers, and the consequences of losing consciousness, and then put this into some historical context. And in part two, I'm going to try and make the case for change. So we're going to look at some hard data. We're going to discuss drowning mitigation, and then we're going to ask ourselves, where does the sport diving community currently sit in this, on this whole, regarding this whole subject? So throughout this talk this evening, I'm going to make reference to inappropriate breathing gaps. And what I'm not talking about is carbon monoxide contamination. What I'm not talking about is the argon hazard of oxygen generation using membrane systems. What I'm talking about is the big three as we breathe a dive, as we all know, and should be familiar with. And hypoxia, hypercapnia, and hyperoxia. And I'm sure all of you will be aware each of these can result in spontaneous loss of consciousness. Also, I'll be making uh, reference to incidents throughout the, the talk. So what's an incident? Well, for tonight, the definition of incident is an unplanned event that degrades safety and increases the possibility of an accident. Well, what's an accident then? Well, that's an unplanned event that culminates in equipment damage, diver injury, or death. So that's incident and accidents. So as you no doubt aware, we read as a complex machines. Even if you take the simplest of an option, simplest rebreather, an option rebreather. Compared to scuba set, there's more to it. As a consequence, there's increased failure modes. And there's one study 
that suggests there's a 23-fold increase in component failure um, of an electronic rebreather compared to a, a manifold twin set. So there's more to go wrong, simple as that. And also, because of complexity, there's more scope for the error. So the logical consequence of that is there's an increased likelihood of an incident or an accident when you breathe the diving. And the data just lays that bare when we look at it in a moment. So a breathing gas, it's artificially maintained by some mechanical or electromechanical means. And as a consequence, it's highly dynamic. So the probability of exposure to an inappropriate breathing gas is increased significantly when using a rebreather. Therefore, loss of consciousness is more likely when rebreather diving. One follows the other. So what is the accident potential? Well, again, let's just define what risk means this evening. It's a term that's often uh, misused or misunderstood. You know, CNS oxygen toxicity is not a risk, it's a hazard. Drowning is not a risk, it's a cause of death. So what is risk? It's a function of the effect or the severity of a hazard and the probability of encountering that effect. So let's put this into context quickly. Um, let's take, for example, uh, uh, we've got um, open circuit and we use an A. We use an A with this piece of equipment. So if you create a hazard log for this diving equipment and the operating environment in which it's to be used, hyperoxia is going to appear there as one of the hazards for sure. But what's the effect of that? Well, oxygen toxicity, loss of consciousness and drowning is the worst effect. How severe is that? Well, that's pretty critical. Single death is critical, depending on what terminology you're using. Uh, multiple death could be catastrophic. We'll call it critical this evening. What's the probability? Well, it's highly improbable. Why? Well, because we stopped diving here at 50 meters. So exposure to high oxygen percentages, or PO2, is, 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 is nigh on impossible if we stop diving here at 50 meters. And we analyze our gas. So What's the risk? It's very low. However, let's compare that then with an electronic CCR. Well, the hazard's the same, so is the effect, so is the severity. But what's the probability of that happening? Well, because of the mitigation you put in place, you might deem it to be unlikely, but it's still a higher probability than highly improbable. So the risk outcome might be medium, depending on what matrix you're using, etc. The point is, risk is a function of the severity and the probability of encountering that effect. So there's a higher risk of experiencing inappropriate breathing gas when it comes to the diving. So see if we get some figures to this. A few years ago, uh, Dr. Andrew Falk uh, came up with a study and he looked at uh, um, you know, the deaths from 1998 to 2010. And from his data, and this is the best we have at the moment, as far as I'm aware, he suggests that uh, there's a rebreather, five rebreather deaths for every 100,000 rebreather dives. Five deaths for every 100,000 rebreather dives. Now, it's an estimate, there's a caveat, a number of caveats in the study. Because we didn't, we don't know exactly how many rebreathers are out there in the world. We don't know how many dives each diver is doing. So, using best estimates and information from the diving agencies, and making an assumption that, on average, a rebreather dives does 50 dives a year. Using those figures, we end up with these sort of results. So, compared to open circuit, it appears that there's approximately 0.5 death per every 100,000 dives. So what does this mean if you look at those, take those figures at face value? It suggests that rebreather fatality is 10 times more than open circuit. 10 times. So let's put that into context. 
about the sports. Horse riding. Uh, that appears to be the same sort of uh, risk, if you like, as open circuit diving. Skydiving. Well, that seems to be twice as risky as open circuit diving, but five times less risky than rebreather diving. Now, I don't know about you, but um, you know, having thrown myself out of aircraft many times in my former life, um, hurtling to the ground under the sort of force of gravity seems far more riskier than going for a paddle around in a local quarry on my rebreather, but not according to the data. Now, the BSEC also did a study of the same period using their reporting uh, information. And from its membership, it suggested um, that uh, the fatality potential is four times greater compared to diving open circuit. So with the information we have around us, um, it's safe to assume that rebreather diving, the fatality is anywhere from four to ten times more likely um, compared to diving open circuit. So that's what we have at the moment. The point is that's a significantly greater risk. And those who are rebreather divers, we already understand and know that hopefully, although we may not understand the numbers behind it, but we 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 should appreciate that it's a higher probability of things going wrong. So this is, should be no surprise to anybody who's, who's a rebreather diver. So let's briefly discuss rescue loading when we talk about rebreathers. Now, we're, we're subject to respiratory loads that we, not, we do not encounter at the surface. We can sort of collectively term those work of breathing. But if you break it down in component parts, we're speaking about resistive effort, the amount of energy required to get that gas moved around the breathing loop, around run the hoses, through the bends, through the scrubber bed. And then on top of that, we've got static lung load or hydrostatic imbalance. The, the difference in pressure between your lung, if you like, and the, the, the bag of gas we're breathing from. And then there's other factors. There's elastins, how well that counter lung expands when we, when, we, when we blow out, particularly at the end of exhalation. Is it big enough to expand? Does it have enough room to expand? We've got to displace water. That takes energy. Where's that energy coming from? It's coming from us, your respiratory muscles. We've got additional bed, bed, bed space. It's not much. It might go the internal drum of the mouthpiece. But at depth, this is all adding up to the innate bed space within our respiratory tree. So when it comes to CO2, this starts potentially to have an impact. So individually or collectively, all of these can have a profound effect upon ventilation and, more importantly, the removal of CO2. And if we don't remove CO2 efficiently, <clears throat> we end up with losing consciousness spontaneously in most, most cases with CO2. So let's look at another case study. This one's focused primarily on static lung load or hydrostatic imbalance. So a diver is using a rebreather with over the shoulder counter lungs, and they haven't been connected to the harness. So he's on a physically demanding descent against the tide. And his counter lungs are observed floating above the diver's head. This has now placed a significant negative lung load upon him. He's got to try and suck this gas from a lower pressure zone above him into a higher pressure zone where his actual lungs are. By the time he gets to 50 meters, he's unconscious. Just fast asleep. Why? CO2 toxicity due to hypoventilation. He's been unable to sufficiently ventilate his deep lung, his, vent his alveoli. So he's retained CO2, he hasn't flushed it out, and as a consequence, has very quickly fallen asleep. And then there's the effect of gas density. Now, when I first saw this graph a number of years ago, my jaw really hit the floor. So along the bottom, you can see the horizontal line, you've got uh, depth and feet. And then uh, the vertical line, we've got uh, maximum voluntary ventilation from zero to 100%. So this particular study 
they took a group of subjects and they asked them to uh, breathe in and out of the of a device as hard and as fast as they could for 15 seconds. And you do that number of times and you take the average. And that's your individual 100%, if you like. So that's done at the surface. And of course, it's breathing in. They then take the same group of subjects in a recompression chamber and they take them down to depth and ask them to repeat the exercise. And you can see the red curve, the decline in ventilation with depth. And everybody should understand this. So let's go to 30 meters, 100 feet. On average, you're down to 50% of the ventilation capacity compared to the surface. 50% at 30 feet, 30 meters, sorry. You've got 40 meters, the typical depth we stop diving an air diluent, stop using an air diluent. We're down to around about 45% of our ventilation capacity. And let's go over 54 meters, where we're down to 40%. Now, hopefully, very few people are diving an air diluent down to 54 meters. I mention only because I'm running military courses where the military organizations are, are happy to use an air diluent down to 54 meters, because they've been using nitrox down to that depth since World War II. Um, so an air diluent of 54 meters, you're down to approximately 40% of your ventilation capacity. So we've got increased resistive effort from higher gas density. This will very quickly result in respiratory muscle fatigue. And if you've ever experienced this, it's quite terrifying, because you physically cannot breathe any harder but your legs, your muscles and your legs feel fine. Those are the primary, you know, motive muscles when you're diving. They're not exhausted, but your, your respiratory muscles are, and you cannot breathe sufficiently or ventilate sufficiently. And all this is compounded by those rebreather loads we just spoke about. Hydrostatic imbalance, uh, in particular. So we end up with hypoventilation again low breathing. Now, you may be breathing hard, but the fact is you're not flushing the alveoli sufficiently. So that's where, that's where ventilation matters. Uh, so it results in hypoventilation. So let's not forget, you know, when we look at this graph, oxygen consumption and CO2 production is independent of depth. But ventilation is not. And ventilation is, of course, the key to getting rid of CO2. So we can still produce the same amount of CO2 at depth as we can at the surface. We just can't get rid of it. To, uh, so, so, so to a greater or lesser degree, we are all sort of, if you like, self-poisoning when we go diving because we are, not, we are, we are unable to sufficiently flush the CO2 um, to, with great efficiency. And most of the time, it, it doesn't matter, it doesn't impact us because we're not working hard, the levels are very low. It, ha it matters when we start working hard. That's when it matters. And suddenly we produce a lot of CO2, but we can't flush it out. And then what happens, we get what's sort of loosely called deep water blackout. But in reality, this is worse for us as divers because this study, the, the subjects were wearing their daily clothing just like you and I are now. So imagine the, the restriction of a, of, of a wetsuit on your ability to expand your lung. You can overcome that, but when it's on top of a load of other loading, that wetsuit could be, could be the crucial thing that stops, that overloads or prevents the inability of you to breathe, to breathe properly. Think of the straps on your, on your, on your, on your rebreather. All of this is restricting your ability for your lungs to expand. So it's going to be worse for divers, particularly rebreather divers. Again, because this study was only focused on moving gas in and out of your own respiratory tree, your own lungs, the plumbing in your own lungs. As rebreather divers, we've got to move that gas not only in and out of our own lungs, we've also got to move it around the breathing loop and through the scrubber bed. So it's going to be worse for us as divers. Absolutely for sure. And the consequences of not flushing out CO2, subconsciousness. So
So case study number three, this is at Duke University in the US. Uh, Duke University is very famous for deep diving research. And a case of, you know, deep water blackout. So they're uh, using a closed circuit mixed gas rebreather. And uh, they've got a set point of 1.4 and they're using air diluent. And they're at 55 meters. This is where many milfries is, as I said, it's quite acceptable. And heavy exercise uh, on a trapeze. So I've participated in many of these, uh, many of these sort of trials in the past. And both you as a, as a diver are heavily instrumented so that your biometrics can be monitored. And so is your life support system, particularly um, your end tidal CO2. That last bit of uh, breath, the amount of CO2 in that is very important to know because it's highly indicative of your CO2 levels in your blood. So the diver is working hard and he's asked to slow down because his end tidal CO2 is exceeding safe parameters. But he ignores that order to slow down and then spontaneously loses consciousness. So he's uh, revived from the water because the, the air bubble in the chamber is just above his head and he has no memory of the event. And again, what's the bit of hypercapnia? You do hypoventilation. So uh, deep water blackout, the effect of CO2 can be quite profound. And don't think this only happens at uh, you know relative deep depths. If we refer back to the graph we just looked at, by the time you get to 10 meters, you've already lost 25% of your ventilation capacity. 25%. Then the curve starts to sort of flatten out a bit. But the initial drop is significant in ventilation capacity. So when I last uh, gave this talk, um, that was in Oztec, uh, probably an audience of about 150 people. So I asked how many would be the dives in the audience and a, you know, a large amount of hands went up. So I then asked, please keep your hand up if you feel or believe there's no possibility of exposure to an appropriate breathing gas. Keep your hands up if there's no possibility. And every hand came down, which is great. Nobody was delusional. But generally, this is where our thinking, our, our logical reasoning sort of uh, stops. Perhaps it's um, sort of an innate psychological survival trait to not contemplate worst case outcomes too much. Otherwise, we would stop exposing ourselves to potential harm. I don't know. But beyond this point, what tends to psychologically dominate is the thinking it will never happen to me. Because we haven't followed the logical conclusion. If you believe that, is, that you have a risk of exposure to inappropriate gas, then you logically must conclude that you, are, you risk losing consciousness. And if we do lose consciousness, what's the consequence? Well, relaxation of the jaw muscles. So the time for that to happen can vary depending on the, the disabling injury. So if it's an Oxygen toxicity event, doing the tonic and clonic phase of that, the jaw muscles may be tightly clamped together. But eventually, they will relax. And as a consequence, the mouthpiece will likely be dropped. If it's hypoxia or hypercapnia, then the relaxation process happens near enough immediately. So the mouthpiece is dropped very quickly. So once we drop up the mouthpiece, for well, the very next Inhalation, we start to aspirate water. This kicks off the asphyxiation cycle. Concurrently with that, we start venting gas from the breathing loop. Out of the mouthpiece, inhale check valve comes gas. Into the exhale check valve goes water. And we start to flood up the loop. And we start to lose buoyancy. And then in a very short time, drowning occurs. That's the typical chain of events. And that's the chain of events we, 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 we need to break as we breathe the divers. Or at least take steps as far as is possible to dry and break. So is this any, is any of this new to us? No, of course not. Um, 
let's just jump back a wee bit in time. Well, I say a wee bit, let's go back 50 years. Let's go back to 1970 when the electrolyte was introduced first to the market. The world's first constant partial pressure um, electronic rebreather. It was aimed at the higher end of the market. It was quite an expensive piece of equipment, but it was very quickly withdrawn from the market uh, because um, with a short space of time, there were three drowning fatalities. And that's it, the product was withdrawn. But, you know, so that the Rubrida Genie was now out of the bottle, so to speak, and was never going to be put back in there for long. And it took about 20 years for it, start, for it to start to reappear again. So by the early 1990s, there was significant interest in rebreathers in the sport and the emerging technical diving world. And there were a number of manufacturers threatening to bring rebreathers onto the market, and there were some very uh, entrepreneurial individuals even away in the garages um, on their own sort of uh, prototypes. So as a consequence of all this, Aquacore, which was uh, you know, a leading technical diving magazine at the time, they issued their C2 issue. And um, you know, I've got a copy that still stands today as a great reference document because it was so much interest. So within two years of this, we started to see rebreathers actually at the market. The Draga Atlantis, which became a dolphin, uh, semi-closed. Um, Dave Thompson in the UK yeah, was busy with his prototype, the electronic rebreather, which of course was picked up by uh, AP valves, um, re-engineered and productionized into what we now know as the Inspiration Classic. And there were others as well. These are just the main ones here in the UK, for example. At this point then, there was no turning back. Um, they were out there and it was some incredible times. So, as a consequence of all this interest, uh, the industry organized Rebreather Forum 2 um, in the USA in 1996. And one of the key objectives of this forum was to reach consensus on the key safety issues in order to help shape an emerging sport Rebreather market. Because back then, there were no training standards. Um, the expertise for what it was resided in the military. Uh, so everything was new. So how are we going to bring this product safely to the consumer market? And that was one of the key objectives of the Breathe Forum 2. And we're going to look at some of these safety uh, consensuses in a moment. So the market evolved. And a typical dive, technical dive boat in 1985 was twin set um, scuba. And then a, a year late, uh, sorry, a decade later, we have a, a boat full of rebreathers, which is, you know, what we tend to see today. But there's a comment made by a gentleman called Billy Deans back in 96 uh, at the Rebreather Forum 2. Um, and Billy Deans was a pioneer of technical diving down in Florida back, back then. And he said, the challenge is going to be bringing the technology to market without killing too many divers in the process. That's what he foresaw as the challenge. So over the next decade then, there was, as predicted, a disproportionately high number of rebreather fatalities. And from the statistics, they peaked in 2005, where there was 24 fatalities that year, with an average of 20 per annum thereafter. And for the size of the rebreather community, which is very small back then, that was a lot, a hell of a lot. I mean, it was a wonderful time in the sense that uh, your diving exploration was being pushed, new boundaries explored. But it was an awful time uh, because it was literally every other week you were hearing of a rebreather fatality. And as I said, it was a very small community at the time. So. In 2007, because of what was going on and the number of rebreather fatalities, Dan USA undertook a groundbreaking study. And it stands today as one of the definitive studies on rebreather fatalities. And they analyzed 964 open circuit fatalities from 1992 to 2003. 
along with 80 repeated fatalities from 98 to 2006. There were many more repeated fatalities during this period. But the reason they only used 80 in the study is because they had a very high criteria for the accident investigation information, particularly the cause of death as defined by a coroner. That was one of those critical pieces of information they wanted for this for this study to have uh, validity. So what they did, in simplistic terms, they looked at the trigger, the initiating root cause, the disabling agent, what was the effect of the trigger? What was the disabling injury, something that causes death or makes strong unlikely? And critically, what was the cause of death specified by a coroner or medical examiner in the US? So take a quick, simple example, electronics failed. There was a rapid ascent, the consequence of hypoxia because oxygen was not added to the breathing loop, drowning, cause of death. So what we're going to do now is compare the 1996 uh, safety consensus points with the DAN study data 10 years later and see what the correlation is. So let's first look at the trigger, something that turns an uneventful dive into emergency. So in 1996, the consensus was reached that rebreathers are much more complex than open circuit. We've just discussed that, we understand that. So what's the implications of this? Well, in terms of the triggers, you can see here and the light gray column is the rebreather and the black is open circuit. So equipment trouble features far more prominently as a trigger in rebreather diving compared to open circuit. That, I suspect, is no surprise. It's just validating what we sort of intuitively understand. Let's look at the disabling agent comparison. What's the effect of the trigger? So consensus from 96, the breathers are much more complex than open circuit with insidious risk. So what do we mean by insidious risk? Was inappropriate breathing gas. Uh, which can render you unconscious spontaneously with little or, little or no signs or symptoms, insidious risk. So how does inappropriate breathing gas feature when it comes to disabling aging comparisons? Well, again, it's far more dominant compared to open circuit, as you can see. Moving on, the disabling injury, something that causes death or makes drowning likely. So we remain with this insidious risk consensus from RF2. And this is where the kicker starts to happen. So in approximately 55% of the cases studied, inappropriate breathing gas was the disabling injury, compared to around about 3% with open circuit. So we've already discussed dynamic breathing loop, dynamic breathing gas, uh, highly dynamic as a consequence. And then the final phase of the investigation is the cause of death specified by a coroner. And the consensus in 96 was loss of consciousness presents a significant hazard when using rebreathers, likely to result in death by drowning. So here's, you know, the kicker. In 94% of the cases studied, Rebreather the cases, death was the consequence of drowning. Now, of course, it features highly open circuit as well. But let's not forget, the chance of getting to that point is far more, far greater with using a rebreather than compared to open circuit. Because of all the reasons we just discussed. So, what was put forward as safety consensus points in 1996 was validated a decade later by Dan when they did their study. And then outside of human error and equipment problems, there's increasing suspicion that uh, respiratory loading uh, can induce uh, respiratory strain um, on somebody with underlying cardiovascular health problems. Just the very fact, the, the effort required to breathe is overloading people's cardiovascular system. And if it's on the edge, they can tip it over. Then there's evidence starting to begin 
to appear regarding the design of certain back mounted counterlungs inducing pulmonary edema. And then there's rare events such as uh, a Ruby the Cave Diver. I, uh, he was using a scooter without a helmet, he banged his head on the cave wall, knocked himself out, immediately dropped his mouthpiece and drowned in front of his buddy, who could do nothing for him except drag, it, drag his corpse out of the cave. So events that are survival at the surface um, uh, become, you know, potentially unsurvival underwater. Events that are potentially readily survival in the water, but because we're not using a certain safety piece of equipment, the chance of surviving these events is uh, significantly reduced. Again, loss of consciousness. And something else I'd like to tackle at this point is um, the time interval between trigger to disabling injury. And there's, there's a kind of a myth you, you often hear that you know, with a rebreather, you've got time to sort out your problem. And if anybody ever says this to you, you know, ask them to qualify what they mean. And if they can't qualify what they mean, they really don't understand the issues. So let's look at four 3H scenarios. Option addition failure when you're deep. Yes, this is one of those scenarios where potentially you've got time to sort things out. But for whatever reason, the system's not adding option. The last the time you looked a minute ago, your set point was 1.3. Um, you've got time, you know, to address this issue. And I'm sure everybody's been trained on rebreather. Your instructor has asked you to switch from a high set point down to the low set point when you're at depth, and you carry on diving and you stay closely monitor your PO2, and you watch how slowly it drops off. And the deeper you are, the more time you have, because there's more oxygen molecules in the breathing loop, so you'll take longer to burn that off. So this is the time where you, this is the scenario where you do have time to sort something out. But in the majority of cases, you don't. So oxygen addition failure if you're shallow. Well, you're going to get hypoxic very quickly if you're shallow. If you've got current limited sensors, so we're heading towards a hyperoxia event now. Um, if you're deep, again, this, if you look at this graph here very quickly, You've got three, begin of the dive, um, you've got three sensors that are tracking one another, and about seven minutes into the dive, two sensors drop below the, the blue horizontal line, the set point, and then one sensor starts a rapid climb up the, set point, set, the oxygen set point. That one sensor climbing high is the one that's actually functioning properly. The other two are not functioning properly, they're currently limited. This particular incident, I, I investigate, have to investigate, and he was an instructor, and he ended up at the event in front of the student after this, because it, it's, it's, his actual PO2 was well above three, well, well above three and a half. So again, you don't always have time. And then there's cancer breakthrough. You know, I'm sure many of you have seen canister breakthrough curves. This is typical. Um, along the bottom, you've got time, and then on the vertical axis, you've got uh, uh, CO2 as a percentage in this case. And it slowly starts to increase from, say, minute 100 until approximately minute 220. It's punching through the 0.5 line. That's 0.5% surface equivalent. Uh, 0.5 kilopascals, whatever measurement you want to hear, you know, use. Then very quickly after that, it's up to 1%, and then the rise then is near vertical. Now, during the first phase of that curve, you will be quite aware of what's going on physiologically. It's probably a little impact to you. About 0.5% to 1%. There may be an elevation in breathing, but you may put that down to some other cause. May not be particular to the fact that it's a little bit harder, but then suddenly beyond one percent, the impact becomes significant, and you have little time to sort it out. Very little time. So it comes back to that saying: if something feels wrong, 
it is wrong. So do something about it very quickly. Mm. Don't second guess yourself. Trust what you're feeling and do something about it. So let's look at another case study, number four. After a short pre-breathe, the diver enters the water. At 40 meters, realize that the electronics are not switched on. He makes a fatal decision now and decides to make an ascent. He loses consciousness near the surface, loses mouthpiece and drowns. In this particular case, what was the time between entering the water and losing consciousness? 150 seconds. 150 seconds. So as I said, if anybody says you've got time to sort things out in a rebreather, not always, not in most cases. So when we look at accident analysis data, you know, violated diving or equipment protocols is often the trigger in the majority of cases, as opposed to equipment malfunction. And if you look at other studies, for instance, from the marine industry or the offshore oil and gas industry, approximately 80% is human unreliability and 20% uh, as a consequence of technical failures. So the human is the weaker, the weak link. The diver in our case is the weak link in the life support chain in most cases. So what do we do about that as divers? You know, what's our mitigation? Well, we hopefully buy a rebreather that's been tested against an international standard. We go get some good training. We plan our dives properly. We analyze and identify our gases. We hopefully use assembly and test checklists. We remain within manufacturer's performance guidelines and our training qualifications. What else do we do? Well, we should pre-breathe and do a function check before we jump in the water. Dive in pairs or in a team. We check up here too frequently. We plan the dive and dive the plan. We undertake preventive and corrective maintenance procedures in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Do we? Do we do all of that? Even if we do. Even if we do. Our consciousness remains a reality of the diving and still remains the single largest cause of death. Drowning. Loss of consciousness and drowning. So insidious risk, as we've just discussed, often there's an inability for a dive to recognize symptoms of unsafe breathing gas. The body often only identifies the seriousness of the situation after loss of consciousness occurs. And for those of you know partaken in uh, accident investigations and studies, common statement is I approached the diver and noticed the mouthpiece was out. A very common statement or words to that effect. So a stage photograph of myself, I'm not sure which is more disturbing, me pretending to be dead or my choice of wetsuit. But um, that's a typical sort of uh, sort of um, scenario people are faced with or diving buttons can be faced with. So, of course, who amongst us would not want to increase the probability of surviving a loss of consciousness if we're underwater? I suspect everybody would, unless you have some death wish. So, let's discuss how we might be able to do that. But let's first go to the extreme end of the scale. Right. At one end of the scale, there's a rebreather. It's designed for 450 meters. It's a bailout rebreather manufactured by one of the companies I work for. It's there as a bailout. If the, if the umbilical supply to the helmet fails, the diver pulls a ripcord, initiates inflation of counter lungs, and he now has a rebreather, which gives him approximately 15 minutes of gas to get back to the diving belt. And as you can see, it's plumbed to the diving helmet. So that's one extreme of the airway protection spectrum. It offers complete protection of the airway. Therefore, there's no uh, loss of interface between the rebreather. There'll be no, there'll be no breathing loop flood. There'll be no loss of buoyancy. There'll be no aspiration of water. And you cannot drown. You may die of something else. Hypoxia, for instance. But you won't drown. 
let's go to the other extreme, uh, uh, other end of the sort of airway protection spectrum, right at the other end, where there's no airway protection. And consequences of that we've already spoken about. So generally, the sport and the technical diving industry is positioned at the lower extreme end of the airway protection spectrum. That's where it sits at the moment, in the main, at the extreme lower end. So what could we do about that? Well, you know, we could think about using a fourth place mask that are many images, certainly protects the airway. Some of them increase fields of view. In cold water, they're very advantageous. If you want to use communications, they reduce jaw fatigue. But they've got disadvantages, many of them. Cost is one, complexity, increased training requirements, difficult to clean the ears. I want a person that suffers from that with full face masks. They've got increased dead space, depending on the design. And there's possibly a reduced sort of flexibility when it could be with regards to switching to gas supplies. So a full face mask was never likely to be adopted and never will be adopted in reality despite the recommendation from the 1996 Rebreather Forum 2 conference. It was never going to be adopted. Is there something else we can do? Well, here's some historical photographs. As you look at the screen, the one on the, on the left is from the 1950s. It's a DC-55. I used to dive this Rebreather. It's a semi-closed passive nitrox system. In the center, we have an oxygen Rebreather with nitrox cylinders on the back so the diver can go deeper than oxygen permits. And then uh, from the 1970s, we have a trimix rebreather from the French, used under 80 meters. The French Navy are the only Navy that uses trimix. They have, uh, they have since the 70s, in both open circuit and rebreathers. Um, and there's a common, common safety component that you might notice in all of those. But these, some of these photographs are 50 years old. Um, here's one from literally uh, two months ago of a uh, rebreather I was test diving. And if you look closely, that, holds, that too also has one of the this, this same safety feature. And that's the mouthpiece retainer strap. So again, on the left, we have a, a mechanical rebreather using trimix down to 80 meters for mine clearance divers. In the center, we've got to be designed for 100 meters use. It dynamically mixes oxygen and 100% inert gas. And then we have a simple oxygen rebreather on the right. They all have that same safety component. And that's called a mouthpiece restraining strap, which is common to almost all military rebreathers that do not use a face mask. Because in the event of loss of consciousness, if worn correctly, the probability of mouthpiece falling out is significantly reduced, thus protecting the airway. So this will break that cycle, hopefully, of aspirating fluid and the asphyxiation process. So these are two comparative photographs, completely staged, as I mentioned. This is on, uh, I think, the deck of San Francisco Maru, I think, in Lagoon. The, the small insert one, which you saw earlier, I closed the loop, took it out, and relaxed. That was the result. Second, the main photograph is I just relaxed, still breathing from the loop. That's the result. Significant differences. Well, what's, what's the sort of um, the efficacy? What's the evidence for the effectiveness of the mouthpiece restraining strap? Well, there are plenty anecdotal reports. And I travel the world and I pick these up. Um, but that's anecdotal. There's personal experience. I've seen uh, drowning prevented in two cases in my career. Um, as a consequence, um, one was Lima submarine at 50 meters on an oxygen rebreather. We've been down there too long to do the oxygen toxicity event. Diver was recapitated, didn't drown. Uh, second one was a test diver rebreather in a freely tank. That went unconscious. Hypercapnia in three meters. Didn't drown. And then 
there's myself squeezed into a, you know, an STV shown here um, for two or three hours at a time. And when you're on your breather, and if you're warm enough, you, you doze off for a few minutes, two or three minutes at a time. You're effectively unconscious. But am I drowning? No, I'm not. Why? Because my rebreather mouthpiece has been placed by a retaining strap, and I've just dozed off. There's nothing else to do. But that's all, again, anecdotal. Do we have something hard evidence? Do we have any hard evidence? Well, a study came out from France in 2011, which is particularly relevant. So they analyzed 153 accidents over 30 years. And 54 of those led to loss of consciousness in the water. So that's good. Now, those of you who are with the divers, I'd just like you to think, within your own community, if there were 54 events of loss of consciousness when diving a rebreather, what percentage of those do you think would result in going? More than 50%? More than 60? I would estimate that more than 80% would probably result in drowning, given all the evidence we've just present, seen. Well, how many result in drowning in this case? Three. That's 5.5%. Only five and a half percent of those lot of those individuals who lost consciousness underwater result in drowning. So the study goes on to state gas toxicities frequently encountered by French military divers using repeaters. Gas toxicities in appropriate gas. And the very low incidence of fatalities over 30 years can be explained by the strict application of safety diving procedures. These procedures include using a strap to hold the mouthpiece in position so that an unconscious dive can still breathe without risk of drowning. Now, it'd be unfair of me to say that's the only safety procedure. It isn't. The other safety procedure the study mentions is the fact that the divers, or the dive, they dive in pairs and they're linked by a buddy span. That's a, a two meter long piece of rope. So one buddy can lend assistance to the other quite quickly. So there's, it's not absolute proof, but it's highly indicative of the fact that the use of a mouthpiece restraining strap can restrict or reduce drowning fatalities. So let's just quickly recap then. So we discussed equipment complexity, increasing error and equipment failure potential with rebreathers, inappropriate breathing gas, so there's a significantly higher exposure potential. Increased drowning probability. So that was first in the sport diving industry encountered in 1970 and was foreseen and document, documented in 1996 at the launch of the sport diving rebreather. And drowning, single largest cause of rebreather death. So, you know, just a question, I'll throw it out. Um, has the sport diving community adequately addressed the specific hazard of loss of airway protection following loss of consciousness? Well, I, I believe the data suggests that no, there has not been a cohesive, coordinated response to this reality. Now, this is not a crit uh, criticism of the industry or individuals or manufacturers. You know, a lot of good people are doing a hell of a lot of good work to try and keep us safe. We now have a, a robust um, design and test consumer standard. We now have comprehensive training curriculums and documentation um, and standards. So everything's moving in the right direction. However, in the main, for the last quarter of a century, uh, the focus has been on preventing loss of consciousness quite understandably. And yet, despite this, after 25 years, loss of consciousness remains dominant. As a consequence, drowning remains the single largest cause of death. So is it time now to specifically address this as an industry, as individuals, as divers, as instructors, as manufacturers? Despite all everything else we've tried to reduce 
Fatalities, they remain a big reality, drumming being, the, of course, the largest cause of death. I think it's time to take a look at it. I mentioned we've got a, you know, quite a robust consumer standard for rebreathers now, and that's in the form of the rebreather standard 14143. So if mouthpiece retraining straps are that important, does this standard recognize the value of them? Yes, it absolutely does. If you go to the standard, and I've uh, you know, uh, worked on the reader projects where we have to comply with the standard and test in accordance with the standard, it makes reference to the face piece. And this is defined as a mouthpiece assembly, a half mask, a full mask, or helmet. And the mouth, the face piece, shall minimize the ingress of water during normal use and in the event of a dive in fallen unconscious or having a convulsion. It shall be adjustable or self adjustable and shall hold the face piece assembly firmly and comfortably in position. And yet, despite this clear requirement in the rebreather standard, as far as I'm aware, only one sport rebreather manufacturer, which is Revo, supplies their rebreather with a mouthpiece retraining staff, retraining staff fitted the standard. Um, I think in fairness, I think Maoris are about to do the same with their new semi-closed horizon rebreathers. But historically, only Revo has been doing this. Um, again, in fairness, you know, manufacturers, some manufacturers do offer uh, a retaining strap as an option, and they put some design effort into that. But in reality, most divers are unaware of it because it isn't standard. And therefore, even when they do become aware of it, because it's an additional cost, they don't purchase it. And as a cost of the industry broadly doesn't, hasn't learned the, the safety benefits of a market restraining strap. So, you know, over the last two decades, I've come across uh, a number of arguments against their use. So I'd just like to address the key ones I've uh, come across. So it restricts prevents access to alternative emergency gas supplies. Like I say, categorically, no, it does not. I teach this skill constantly to military rebreather divers and closing the mouthpiece, pulling the mouthpiece down to below the chin onto your chest and replacing it with a demand valve is a very simple procedure. So no, it doesn't restrict access to alternative breathing gas supplies. The retention of the mouthpiece will result in discomfort. Well, perhaps it might if you do the strap up too tight, or perhaps for individuals it might. But on the whole, everybody I've spoken to who have converted to the use of a mouthpiece retraining strap reports back that it's far more comfortable. Particularly you use a bailout valve, a heavy bailout valve, because it supports the weight. You can totally relax your jaw muscles, and it's held there. So quite the opposite occurs. Particularly on long dives, it's more comfortable. The strap is an additional complication. Well, I guess it is. Um, again, it's a photograph of me on a decompression strap there. Um, the retaining strap is over my mask strap. Is it, is, is it an additional complication? I would argue not. Um, not, not for impact safety. It does not guarantee the preservation of the airways, so why bother? I admit it does not guarantee anything. Nothing is guaranteed, but it increases the probability of protecting the airway. So that's why you, I bother. I use a bailout valve, so I don't require a mouthpiece retaining strap. But the obvious flaw in that argument is that you've got to be conscious to use a bailout valve. Now, I suspect the person who gave me that response probably thought that they would be aware of the symptoms of inappropriate breathing gas and would have time to switch to open circuit. And in a large, large number of cases, that will be true. However, as we've just discussed, spontaneous loss of consciousness readily happens. And as a consequence, having a bail of valve or not is of no use to you. You will die from inappropriate breathing gas 
anyway. So what's the point? Well, it's going to take longer to die from an inappropriate breathing gas than it is from drowning. So that's the point. You know, you take a, you take quite a while to you know eventually for light to stop when you're doing a hypoxia um, or hyperoxia. You know, it happens very quickly when you drown. Um, so increase increasing the time of survival. That's why it's more important to concentrate on training to prevent loss of consciousness. I agree. We must focus on that, and that's what we've been doing for the last 25 years. But people are still drowning in high numbers when it comes to rebreather fatalities. And it's more important to design a rebreather that is reliable and appropriate gas monitor alarms. Yeah, very important, agree. But the reality is, complex machines go wrong and humans make mistakes. And as a consequence, we still are losing consciousness and drowning. So, you know, I, I would argue it's time for the community to sort of change its culture. Um, after 25 years, so we know enough. It's time to revisit this specific point and address it directly. Because uh, a lot of people are losing their lives unnecessarily, I argue. Um, you look at the fatality reports and there's situations where those people could have been saved. So let's look at the seatbelt example. For those in the UK, if you're old enough, you may recall approximately 40 years ago, the government at the time decided to mandate the use of seatbelts, and there was uproar. The motoring industry didn't want it, the motoring public didn't want it, but the government went ahead and did it anyway. And overnight, there was a, a, a significant drop in uh, car crash fatalities. People were stopped flying face first through the windscreen. It got to a point where within a few months there was a shortage of donor, org donor organs. So it had an immediate effect. And since then, there's been a change of culture. I doubt whether any of us now gets into a motor vehicle without automatically putting a seatbelt on. Even though statistically, the chance of needing that seatbelt is extremely low, extremely low. But we do it automatically because none of us wants to fly fly face first through the windscreen. So it's been a change of culture. You know, different approach to these days. And I think it's time for us to start applying that sort of mindset to our rebreathers. So is it time for standards to start addressing this? You know, I'll leave that to the training agencies or the, the heads of training agencies. Um, but when trainees are under their guidance and their control during training courses, should they be at least recommended, if not mandating, that you sell not these retainers retain strap? That will start that cultural change because trainees will then become accustomed to them immediately from day one of review the diving. Not only that, all the instructors will be using them. So we get good example. And if that happens, manufacturers will start putting more design effort into them and will begin to make them more comfortable and more user-friendly. So let's go back then to case study number one and why he survived. And of course, you've already guessed it. Um, he actually ran out of oxygen. He was the second dive of the day. And I mentioned the second dive because that also features very prominently in rebreather accidents. Why? Because we don't pay the rebreather the same amount of tension on the second dive prior to the first dive. Well, well, it was working a half hour ago, then why, why should it not be working now? So he ran out of O2. He went unconscious at the surface, um, you know, wasn't paying attention to his alarms and displays, which is often, often happens at the surface. And he went unconscious. And he sank. The, air, the retainer strap preserved his airway. And eventually, he got to a depth where the PO2 in the breathing gas had risen to such a point that he regained consciousness. And that's the point where he woke up and, and wondered, what the hell? Why am I back underwater? His ears are screaming. He's rapidly sinking. 
So this is where the instinctive release was BC in flight. She regained consciousness and then implemented self rescue. Arrived at the surface, somewhat in a state of distress, of course, but was recovered and lived to tell the tale. So we have a clear example in here of some, a self rescue as a consequence of airway preservation due to loss of consciousness. If you're diving with a team or a buddy, if you lose consciousness, if your airway is preserved, that buddy had time potentially to recover you, to implement the control buoyant lift to get you to the surface. As a consequence, you're not going to aspirate water at all. So to begin to wrap it up, guys. So to summarize, we agree that there's increased failure modes and human error potential. You're statistically more likely to experience a serious or fatal accident if you die in a rebreather. Inappropriate breathing gas is the single largest disabling injury. This is borne by the Dan and the French military study. Drowning is high, highly probable following loss of consciousness unless you protect your airway. I approached the diver and noticed the mouthpiece was out is a typical statement of an eyewitness. So if we restrict or prevent fluid aspiration, we can de delay or potentially prevent the early onset of drowning. And military diving organizations consider the mouthpiece retaining strap a safety critical design feature and mandate its use. So every single rebreather I'm in design and I'm involved with, and it's been many of the last 20 years, everyone has a mouthpiece retaining strap because you couldn't go to a customer unless it had one. They would demand it immediately. So to conclude, in the vast majority of cases, we breathe the diaries are not dying of equipment failure, hypoxia, hyperoxia, or hypercapnia. Uh, these are all triggers for disabling injuries or agents. In 94% of cases studied, the actual cause of death is drowning. So a correctly fitted retaining strap will likely delay the onset of water aspiration. It's going to break that cycle. Not indefinitely, but initially it will break that cycle. So this will in potentially increase the probability of surviving that event. So hopefully you've seen this evening, there's a growing body of evidence that indicates the use of a mouthpiece retaining strap will increase the probability of surviving loss of consciousness in the water. If that happens, then again, the knock-on effect of that will be a reduction in sport rebreather diving fatalities. That's the logical conclusion of that. So that's, uh, that brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, again, those of you who have made it this far, thanks very much. Um, I understand that BZAC are going to send out a formal paper to you all. Uh, I understand they've got your email addresses. So I have a lot of tonight. But there is a form of paper that was published in the Diving and Hyperbaric, Hyperbaric Medicine Journal a few years ago. So that's going to be emailed to you, which captures this, everything I've spoken of tonight. And for those of you who might be thinking, right, well, okay, great, where do we get a mouthpiece retaining strap from? Well, there is one on the market that you can go and buy. Um, I've got one in my hands right now. It's from Repo. They have now they now make their own. Originally, they used to um, they used a Draga military mouthpiece for training strap. Um, one I've used for 30 years, not the one, but the, the, the type. So, but I've got with me tonight a a, a, a version of it, and it's very good. Um, I don't die with Revo rebreathers. I've got no affiliation with the company, um, but they sent me one to look at, and it, it's it's a quality product. So I'm led to believe you can go on and order one from Revo. It's a simple case of uh, you know, fitting it to your mouthpiece or your bailout valve uh, and give it a go. So they're there, they're accessible, and there is a very good um, sort of design on the market at this point.